Okay, so I made a PowerPoint. All right, so we're gonna talk about organic modeling, specifically getting something ready for games. For visual effects and like CG stuff, it's a little different. There's some things you don't have to do and some other things that you will have to do for that, but we'll focus on game ready production, get it into Unreal, we can mess around, play with it, whatnot. So the programs you'll probably need for this process is ZBrush or Blender, so something you'll actually do the sculpting in. Maya, where you'll retopologize, cut your UVs, and lay out your texture maps. Uh, you'll also need a texturing program. Uh, that can be Substance Painter, 3D Coat, Mari, and I'm sure there's more out there. And then you'll need a rendering software. Uh, we'll be using Unreal. But if you just wanted to render your asset to make it look good, you could use Maya's Arnold, Marmoset Toolbag 4, something like that. So our objective here is to create a production-ready character that looks as good as possible with as little amount of drag on the game engine as possible. So this means we're going to be going for something that's low poly and with as little texture maps as possible because it takes a lot of energy from the engine to load those texture maps. So even a super complex character may only have four or five maps, sometimes even less. So the steps that we'll go through here is um, we'll be doing concept and reference. So I also like to stress that this part is super duper important, super duper important, but we'll talk more about that later. And then we'll go over some sculpting stuff. I won't go too, too into the sculpting, maybe just give a couple tips, because I feel like a lot of us have um, done sculpting before or vaguely familiar with the process already. Uh, we'll definitely talk about pre-topologizing. I know that this process is a little confusing, daunting at first, but it'll be okay. And then we'll talk about cutting UVs, which is very, very easy, surprisingly. I didn't think so at first, but I'll show that. There we go, oh, back to that. All right, so baking, we'll go over baking as well, which I kid you not, is a two to three minute process. Once you know how to do it, it'll be very easy. Texturing, I won't show too much texturing. I'll mainly talk about it because it can be very time consuming. And I think you guys get the gist, it's like painting. Um, and then we'll talk about what we'll need to talk about and think about for the process it takes to rig and animate your model, mainly like things to keep in mind to be friendly to your rigger and your animator. And we'll briefly talk about lighting and rendering briefly. Um, procedure. So it's good to have an idea before you start how long something should take you. So your concept creating time or gathering reference is very important because it saves you a lot of time down the line. So you're not scrambling to find good references or you're not making mistakes. So basically you can search online for a good concept if you're just trying to practice or you can be handed a concept in this process by one of our concept artists that we have working on the project. Um, good reference is super, super important to being successful. I can't stress that enough. Like there's been times when I started to sculpt just trusting my own mind, but you'll realize that your brain plays tricks on you and you don't remember things perfectly correctly how they are in nature. So sculpting. It really depends on how long this will take you. If it's something simple, it can take you just like two hours, no biggie, or it can take you 20 hours, two weeks. It also depends on the complexity and your skill level and how fast you work, if you know the shortcuts on the keys and whatnot. So retopologizing and UVs shouldn't take too, too much time, but I say that because once you learn how to do it, it goes fast but you gotta learn how to do it first. So like when I was first learning Quadraw, I was super confused, didn't know keyboard shortcuts and it took a really long time. Um, texturing can take various amounts of time depending on what you're texturing. So, but you know, you knowing your project, you'll be able to kind of think about how long something might take you. 
And then rendering. Rendering is the best part. It's when all of your hard work comes together and you can see how beautiful the thing that you made is, you know? So I also typed out this slide because I assumed that maybe people wouldn't make this meeting. So I could just leave them the presentation and they can go over it at their own time. Um, but yes, yeah, super, super important. This step is great. So I'll talk specifically about call outs though. So this is what I had to do for my first ZBrush class. We had call outs. So you would point to something on your concept and be like, so, hey, I want this to represent the white horse of death, or I want the style of this little thing here to be like from the broke horses back in time. I want there to be skulls on the pad. I want it to look about like that, things like that. So what you've got to think about when you're making a concept is if I handed this to somebody else, would they be able to figure out what I'm talking about, what I'm thinking? If the answer is yes, you're on the right path. So sculpting, use reference. It helps a lot, so much. Like this is after I reevaluated, but I was doing this horse based on like what I thought a horse looked like. And I thought I knew horses really well because I've been a, an honorary horse girl for a long time. And uh, yeah, I don't know what a horse looks like apparently. Cause then I looked at the picture. I looked at my sculpts and I'm like, I was doing this no shape all wrong. The eyes don't look quite like that. That's why you just, you trust yourself, but you also trust yourself to know that you need to do research. Um, some really great tips about sculpting that I think everybody should know is if somebody were to look at your sculpture, right? And they'd be like, oh, I know what brushes they used. They use the damn standard brush and the clay buildup brush. Well, then your sculpture isn't refined enough to be a sculpture yet. You're just drawing on a lump of clay, basically. So, and if you're making a creature and there's not direct reference for that, just think back and be like, all right, so what would this creature need to be functional? You know, what bone structures would it have? What animals can I pull from to build this creature up and make it something that could potentially exist in nature? What adaptations would it have to hunt its prey or to flee from predators? Stuff like that. So another tip is to take advantage of subdividing. So what subdividing is, let me see if I can actually, can everybody see this? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes. Cool, cool. All right, so let's take a step back. So this is what default ZBrush looks like when you open it, right? And this is something that Parrish stresses a lot in his ZBrush classes, is to take it and back this down to a solid color. This really helps you so you're, it doesn't play tricks on your brain and your eyes. And then another thing that I personally like to do is uh, wait for the Zoom stuff to get out of the way, but then go to preferences go down to quick save and put this all the way up because I don't need these quick save files because I'm gonna to remember to save on my own, hopefully. And another thing, when ZBrush is quick saving, sometimes it completely crashes. Or if your computer doesn't have enough space for all these quick save files, you're gonna run into problems and you won't be able to save or even do anything at all. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to like start this. If I remember the video control thing. Yes. Okay. Then we go to edit mode. All right. And let's get rid of this ugly, ugly red color and make it this nice, pretty gray. And we'll go to our geometry tab here and I'll explain what subdividing is. As you can see, all of these little polygons on the face of this circle, right? Or not circle, sphere, sorry. Um, so you can rotate it all about just by clicking and dragging, by the way. And you can pan it around by holding Alt, clicking and dragging. Um, but what we'll do to subdivide, first we'll actually Z-remesh because we don't like the layout of these 
ugly shapes. And if we're going to sculpt, it doesn't need to look like that. Divide, subdividing increases the poly amount. So what it did was it took one square and it went bump and bump through it. And it made more polygons so that when you do sculpt on it, it'll actually look good. So I'm just going to actually bring my drawing tablet out here. My little pen. I'm going to go to, I'm going to press B and I'm going to press C and I'm going to press B. And that's the shortcut to get your clay build up brush, which is the best brush for building up forms. But I'm going to emphasize, look at how ugly that is. It's got all these jagged edges and it's not smooth at all. But we're going to do this, bump it up a couple times. We're going to try again. That's that's much better. It's not quite where I want it to be, but this will be fine if I'm just trying to build up a shape here. But let's just take it all back. And we'll just divide it up again. And now that's super smooth. And when you drag it, you can see the first subdivision level back. And that's fine. That's what it does. And it comes back to perfectly smooth. And another great thing about subdivision levels is if you back it on down and you're having a difficult time when it's totally high poly, you can't smooth things out because it's just too difficult to work with. You bump it down, you smooth it, and then you bump it back up. That's another helpful side effect of using them. So now I'm just gonna draw on here like I told you not to do, but now we've got this little part. I hold shift, I can smooth it out. See how on the highest subdivision level I'm getting really slow results? I can bump it back down to three and I can smooth that super duper easily. And then I bump it back all the way up and I just have to go and smooth it again. But going back and forth allows you to do that a lot quicker. But we're going to go back over here. And another thing to think about is we're still trying to make believable characters. This whole presentation isn't all about characters, but let's pretend we're talking about characters right now. Um, a lot of the time, we don't realize this when we're looking at video game characters, but they'll have these things that we like to call production ready eyes. And that's when the eye is actually made out of two different shapes, the cornea and the iris. And the iris will actually be sculpted out as if actual functioning optics. The pupil will be sculpted out. And then the cornea over top of it is this whole other shape with a slight bulge over where the iris is. And what we'll do in a rendering program is actually just apply a quick glass shader to the cornea so that it quickly becomes shiny, glossy, beautiful, looks like a real eye. And these right here are called wet lines. They're actually just a really thin piece of geometry with a glass shader on them. But what they're meant to do is catch the light and look glossy as if the eye actually has real moisture. And uh, we'll also talk about mouth cavities because in production ready models, they might be animated to talk and stuff like that or bite. You might need to see the inside of it. So when you're modeling a character, you actually have to hollow out their mouth and put gums and teeth and even a tongue. But um, for my character, it was slightly easier than just a little thing because he actually has a, a snoot. But uh, yeah. So when we're ready to retopologize something, we'll actually shift over to Maya because we want some nice edge flow, we want workable things. So when you export your high poly FBX, you're gonna make sure that you have these settings. And I'm gonna stress Maya Y up because you don't want to accidentally import your model backwards. You don't necessarily have to embed maps, but that's totally fine too. Um, a good tip I have here is that when you, F, when you export your FBX, make sure you name it so that you know that this is your high poly version. So it'll be something like name underscore high. 
And then when you're done retopologizing it in Maya, it'll be name underscore low. And then you also want to think in your head. Again, this is the whole planning ahead thing I'm going to emphasize quite a few times. Um, what parts of it you want to be left to the baking process. For me and this project here, I'm going to leave all of these scales to the baking process, all of these wrinkles to the baking process. And you'll see when we're done here how effective the baking process really is and how important it is for game ready models. So when you go into Maya, I'll just demonstrate this, but I'll quickly talk about it for people who are watching the recording. So you'll make sure you select your model. And for this, I literally only did the body because I wanted to make it fast. Um, I selected the body. You have to click this little horseshoe looking thing. It's actually a magnet, but I think it's a horseshoe. You click it, you make it look like a live, uh, you make it a live surface. That's very important so that when you're using Quadral, the little dots you're making actually snap to the surface. One time I didn't remember this step and I was so flustered for like a solid hour before I broke down I'm like, all right, fine, you too. And I figured out I literally just forgot to press a button and that's it. Um, another thing is uh, oftentimes we sculpt things symmetrically. So when we just put it into Maya to retopologize it, we can just turn the symmetry on and it's just like, whoa, mind blown. I only have to retopologize half of it. So that's a massive time saver. And another thing to think about when you're planning ahead is if I sculpt this symmetrically, I can retopologize it in Maya before I pose it, right? We can think like that. And if something has the same UVs anyways, it won't matter if you pose it later as long as the UVs stick with it especially as long as the geometry itself doesn't change. Just something to think about. Um, all right, so we're gonna open Maya now. I already have it open, thankfully. Um, and then we're gonna import a model. I'm gonna go to my computer, this. And then I'm gonna go to my dragon body high because it needs to be retopologized. I'm going to import that. It might take a second because this right now is pretty high poly, although it's pretty simple, so it won't take too, too long. Oh, I remember. This might have all of the parts of it, but that's okay. Oh, no, it's fine. Never mind. Ignore what I said. All right. so. Here we have it. This is our high poly dragon head bust thing. I click it and as you can see, there is a lot of polygons happening here. And that is a problem. So to fix this problem, we're gonna go ahead and make that a live surface. And that's cool because now we can actually work with this. But I'm gonna click it and I'm gonna move it because I hate having the grid through it. And that's the thing that happens when you go from ZBrush to Maya because it's not exactly lined up for some reason. Uh, okay. Do I, okay. So apparently I was supposed to move it before making it a live surface, but whatever. Can I quickly And now it's a live surface once again. All right, and we'll do mm -hmm. my mile looks different, but we'll be able to access. So this is important. If your quadra isn't just appearing on the top bar, you can find it under mesh tools. And I like to have it like this when I'm working because I like to be able to quickly go clear dots or something like that really, really easily, super effective. But let's talk about 
some quick tips. So before you start, you should probably have some knowledge of what good topology looks like. Super important. So something I like to call the strip is a way to avoid future issues. You go straight through the middle of the model and you do two, 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 all the way down the middle and you wrap it up like that. And what this does is it prevents awkward moments where you end up being like, should I put a six pointed star here? The answer is no, you never need to put a six pointed star ever. Five pointed stars, okay, they can happen. All right, so a star is born when one edge flow meets another edge flow. For example, I need to move this little things. All right, so for example, the edge flow here around the eye and the edge flow here following the cheekbone. Right here, a star is born. Or right here, a star is born because it follows the nostril and it follows the shape of the face. A star is born. It's fine but you gotta plan ahead where you might find your stars. And you gotta think about your edge flows. So my advice is place them where things don't need to move, where things will not bend weird. Like for example, a lot of people try to place them behind the ears or right here. It just happens because there's a lot of different edge flows happening in the face. They just happen here. They happen here. And you'll start to notice these patterns the more you practice. That's really just what happens. You just learn. One day you wake up and you realize, oh, I know how to use quadro. Oh, I know what good topology looks like. And that's just something that you'll figure out as you practice it. So the way to use quadro is you quickly do some cool little dots and you can do a lot at a time or you can have the workflow where you do one shape at a time, you press shift and you fill, fill it. So I made some cool dots and these dots represent the corner of squares or polygons. So in order to make the shape, I hold shift and I click and it'll give a little preview and you can just be like, yeah, I want it there. I'm gonna confirm that. Yep, that works for me. And it's literally that easy. And then you'll be able to hold shift and then you'll get the relax option and it will allow you to smooth things out. It might take a couple clicks, but we want nice smooth geometry when we're done with this. So I'll give an example of what I mean following edge flow. I won't spend too, too much time on this because I think that you don't need to watch the entire process to understand what's going on. So I'm following the nostril right here. And I'm trying to match the shape size as much as I can. I'm not overdoing the amount of polygons. I think I'm just doing it when I feel that the form is following it. And that's really important because when your topology matches your form, everything is happy and everything is right with the world. And so I'll purposely make these two things come in contact. All right, another thing, I can just press clear dots to unclutter this stuff or to reevaluate what I'm thinking. So, so you want to follow this edge flow, but then you also want to follow this edge flow and you can't make up your mind, so therefore, a star, a star. Um, and sometimes they don't wanna do what you want them to do. So then you just gotta finagle things. And that's just part of it, unfortunately. <laughs> things are crashing though. Mm. My Maya is unresponsive. So we're gonna switch back to this. Can everybody still hear me? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so Maya's being Maya. Uh, I'm gonna refrain from saying the other word that's coming to mind. But 
So now we'll talk about this wonderful process called UVs. And for some reason, they aren't actually really taught in the visual effects curriculum. But that's okay, because I'm here today and I will pass on my knowledge of my looking at YouTube for a few hours. All right, and I'm gonna check on Maya again, see if she's doing all right. But I'm gonna open a new scene. No, <laughs> don't wanna save that. <laughs> All right, and now we're gonna go file, import, and I'm gonna import something that I finished yesterday to prepare for this, because I didn't wanna waste too much time on quad draw so that we can move on to the other steps. All right, so here's our completely done uh, poly surface that is born from quad draw. And you could basically take this poly surface and delete the old, old mesh that had a million gillion polygons. And you can use this. And the cool thing about this is I've already cut the UVs of this, but we're, we're going to redo it. Um, so we'll open up UV editor. And yeah, that's it, I think. And we'll structure our Maya to look like this when we're doing UVs. Um, all right. So as you can see, I've already cut seams of where I wanted my UVs. And I'm gonna tell you why I made these choices. So I chose to cut behind the jaw here because the continuity of this texture doesn't need to be perfect. The continuity of the texture here doesn't need to be perfect. And that's a question I ask myself in my head when I wanna know where I should cut my seams. So I create these little UV islands from the seams. And it starts a little like this. You just get this shape, you go to edge, and you select where you want your seams to be. It's really quite simple. It's just selecting edges. And then you can go here, and you can press cut. It's really, really easy. And I was like so like scared of this process for a long time that I just refused to learn it. And I would just press auto every single time. And uh, then you get these really, really ugly UVs that are useless for texturing because then you get seams all over the place and you wonder why, why my texture looks so jumbled. My smart material didn't line up right. Well, that's because your seams are in terrible locations and you have absolutely no control of what's going on and you always want control so we cut our seams like that for a reason and if you accidentally make a mistake and you cut a seam where you decide oh actually i don't want a seam there anymore you reselect it and you can just sew it back together it's super easy um but what we're what we'll do here is i'll actually go control c control v yeah okay Eh, whatever. All right, so I've selected this new dragon, but I'm going to actually move it over so that we don't get them confused. Just in case somehow deleting the UVs for this one really messes things up. All right, so we'll go to this area over here. I think I did select them. Oh, well. Anyways, you'll go to edit and delete. We're going to start all over. We're gonna pretend that those were your automatic generated UVs. So what we need to do is make more. So we'll select our thingy thing. We'll go to create and we'll go to camera based. This is a jumble of something, but we gotta fix that. So we'll go up here and we will Go real, real close, and then we'll go to edge. And we'll try to select. All right, so another cool thing is that if you had good edge flow, clicking on your edges like that pretty much guarantees that you'll have easy to do seams if your edge flow was good. So this was actually pretty good. There's some things I want to change, but another time. 
and I can't see, so I'm gonna make this bigger. And I'm just gonna try to cut this very quickly and probably not as effectively as it could be, but see how this edge flow happened to be exactly where I wanted it to be? So convenient. And then I can even, usually I make the mouth cavity its own separate thing. I'm not sure if that's good practices or bad practices, but it always worked for me. Um, I actually don't want it cut here though. I want it to be its like own shape. And of course, some places, you know, could be done better, but you'll, you'll learn that. I've learned that. All right. So that's good for the head. And now this perfectly round area, I'll just quickly separate that. And then I'll try to actually see if I can follow these. That one worked out really nice. Some of them got a little messy, but no worries. I'm trying to divide it down the middle because I don't really mind right here um, if the texture is perfectly continuous because I can kind of work it to my advantage. Like I can make these stud things where the spikes will go actually like gold or some other color that's really fun. And it, it would work out in my, in my favor. Oh, something happened where it selected all the way down the middle and I hate when it does that. Okay, that's no big deal. And before you press cut, like just double check where you have things selected. It'll save you a lot of time um, not fixing mistakes. So, uh -uh. why are you doing it there? There you go. So I'll make sure this is all, all cut. Okay, so this is close enough to what I want. Um, so I'll just, do I need to let somebody in? Oh, yeah. I think that was Xiao. Hey. Hey. Uh-oh. It undid my, okay, cool. So this is how we cut UVs. <laughs> and we'll go to cut and sew, and we'll just press cut. It won't look like much happened, but what we actually did is super cool and super important. So we'll go here, go to UV shell, select all of it, and then we'll go to unfold. We'll unfold everything. And now we got this jumbled mess of flattened islands. We'll select it all. We'll go down to arrange and layout. We'll go to, we can possibly orient it. And then we can press layout. And it gives us this automatically packed, possibly not perfect UV map. For this particular project, this will be just fine. But the reason we want to optimize our packing is because when we're using texturing softwares in the future, we'll export the maps as like 4K and we don't want to waste any kind of pixel space where we could have gotten more detail, more color, more cool things. And we don't want to waste resolution basically. And so this will be good. We'll go here, we'll go to export selection. Okay, yes, go to file export selection. And since I already have one, it's called that, I'm gonna name that something different. Dragon demo low. I wanna make sure that I specify that this is my low version so that I don't get confused in the future. Okay. So don't know how long that will take, but We'll switch gears and go back to this for a second. All right, so baking. This is pretty awesome in Marissa Toolbag 4. It takes tops 
two, three minutes. And it's like amazing. You literally plug it in where it says plug it in and it's pretty clear where that's supposed to be. And then you press preview. You can check it out, make sure it's everything that you want and you press fake. I kid you not, that simple. And uh, yeah, there's other programs that can do it. I think Substance Painter can make some pretty cool normal maps, but I have a love-hate relationship with Substance, so I'm just not even gonna bother with that. Toolbag's so much better. It's real time. You can literally put in lights and render it after and ship it off, do a turnaround and make it pretty. Okay, so I already have it open. And I really, really hope that that was done exporting, but we'll find out in a second. Actually, first things first, you gotta go to scene, add object, bake project. And literally, can you guess where the high poly one and the high and the low poly one goes? Literally, it's like, oh, I plug it in there. Oh, I plug it in there. It says high. I wonder which one goes there. Oh, the high poly one. Oh, wonder which one goes under low. Oh, the low poly one. Huh, I didn't have to think too hard. It's super great. All right, so file, import model. So I have all these other ones. Too many. I'm confused already. All right, let's go here. So this is our lovely low poly one. As you can tell, this is not the dragon that I want, basically. So I can import another model, and this one will be my high one. I think it's this one. Actually, I'm pretty sure. But remember, this one's more polygons, so it's going to take a little bit longer to load. T minus 100 years, apparently. Do, 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 I'll stop. All right. Oh, so obviously we have a problem. Things need to be lined up to bake properly. And remember how I moved this in Maya and didn't move it back? Yeah. Oops. But so you just line her back up. I'm sure there's an easier way to do this. There's got to be, but it's literally like that. When you were in Maya, I think that what I would have done was shut off the, the grid instead of moving it. Yeah. Do that instead of what I do. But there we go. So you just line that up the best you can, as close as possible. And this looks pretty good. So pretty good. No. All right. So we have a high poly one and we have a low poly one. So we'll plug our low poly one parented under low and then we'll parent this one under high. And you can't see it, but you can turn it on anytime you want. It really doesn't matter. But you can go to bake project one, preview. Oh. So it asks you to like tell it where it's gonna go. So no problem. Normal dragon. There we go. So now that's our preview of what it's gonna look like when it's baked. And it looks exactly like the high poly version one because Marmoset tool bag is so cool. All right, so we'll press bake be like, yeah, we're good with that. Give it a bit. And let's see here, let's go to the low poly one. And this is its new share, new material. And look, it's got a normal map. So cool. All by itself. We can literally delete that. And there we go. That is a low poly sculpture that you can just plug into a game engine and it won't be a huge problem. And it's got its own special normal maps. It's crazy. 
And like literally that took me three minutes tops and part of it was me having to move the dragon back to where it's supposed to go, <laughs> which could have been avoided in the first place. <laughs> so yeah, that's the baking process in a nutshell. And again, I type all this out because I intend to just leave the presentation in one of the Discord channels. But this is what I got. Like, look at that. That's so cool. And then texturing. I am by no means very good at texturing, but I can talk about it a little bit. So the maps that you laid out with your UV islands and stuff are essentially what you'll be painting on in something like Substance Painter. And you'll just put your low poly sculpture in. As long as it has the same UVs, it won't be a problem. And then when you plug everything back into your rendering software, you'll just put those same normal maps that you just got from the baking process onto it. And it'll look so detailed and pretty and it'll be good. And that's why we also talk about optimizing your space because when you're done texturing, you'll export and hopefully 4K. And you don't wanna waste any of that nice big resolution on your detail. So you can get really cool stuff. This is um, a ma uh, material ID. This is you know my base colors. This is my ambient inclusion. This is my normal map for this one. There's some more examples. This was from my um, my last project in ITGM 346. And that was the base color. I could have laid these out so much better. I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how to cut properly, but I've since learned a lot more. But uh, I cut this in way too many shapes. You could do this so much better. So again, with the continuity of the texture, a lot of the times you can use smart materials. So when you think about that, you should ask yourself, how do I want my materials to lay? Do I want them cut here? Because that's gonna be strategic. I know my character is wearing clothes, so that won't be seen. Or am I gonna mess this all up? <laughs> um, so I'm gonna leave you guys with some things to remember. So planning ahead is your best friend. I will say that over and over again because there's so many times when I totally winged it and I was like, wow, I really shouldn't have done that. Should have used my brain, maybe wrote some kind of like procedure or something. And then plan ahead what things you're gonna leave to the baking process. I've heard Paris say that millions of times. And then he also says, try to learn how to save time. So learn keyboard shortcuts and stuff like that. Literally anything that can increase your speed. And remember in the business world, the time is money. So that's something they're gonna care about when they're looking for somebody to hire. How long did this take you? Oh, it took me about three weeks and you know, sleepless nights. Okay, that's kind of a long time. Oh, it took me two hours top. So, oh, okay, that's, that's good. I like you, but uh. Another thing is that he always said, always said not to draw on your sculpture. Don't just draw your character's abs with the damn standard brush. I remember he'd get so mad about that, but you know, for artists, we can figure it out. You got this. Uh, when you're retopologizing, try not to leave triangles in your mesh because my friend Jackie, our rigger, will get mad at you. And you don't want to upset her rigor. You wouldn't want her to come hunt you down in the middle of the night while you're sleeping. Don't leave triangles in your mesh. Also, don't forget to save several times while you are working. I will scream this so loud at all of my discarded projects that are in cyberspace somewhere that I will never ever get back. All right, and that's that. But also, here's something quick I did in Mars a tool bag. You know. I don't work for them, not sponsored, but I love them. Literally, I changed the color and just played with things. It's so fun, you should try it. There's a 30 day free trial, but after that it's $300. So hopefully you like it enough. And that's it. 
Any questions? You said this oh, program was a one-time purpose, yeah? Yes, perpetual license, it's wonderful. All right. And I also included some helpful links if you guys needed some more in-depth things. But yeah. I think you're better than a professor. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you. No problem. I really do hope it helps. Like I'll it leave did. this, I'll leave this whole thing in one of these Discord thingy things. And you know, I just uh I wish somebody had helped me when I was like learning all of this stuff because it was really 